Welcome, uh, colleagues and uh, and everyone online and in the room to the McKedda History and Archaeology Seminar. Um, my name is Edgar Taylor. I'm a lecturer in the Department of History, Archaeology, and Heritage Studies. And this is our sometimes weekly or biweekly seminar, or whenever we organize it, uh, on Wednesdays uh, for the department. And you're welcome to, uh, to join uh, whenever we have an event. Uh, for those who are here, there's a uh, sign-up sheet or attendance sheet going around. And if you want to be added to the uh, mailing list, uh, I will uh, will include you in that as well. Um, we're here today for a seminar with um, a frequent uh, visitor to the department, uh, Professor Derek Peterson, uh, and uh, the discussant, Dr. Uh, Anna Dima. And uh, so first, I just um, uh, want to say we have with us uh, the Dean of the uh, School of Liberal and Performing Arts, Dr. Pamela Kanakwa. Uh, very welcome. And and we will be joined by um, the head of department, uh, Dr. Charlotte uh, Mafumo, in, in a few minutes. But as you can imagine, this is, uh, there are many administrative things <laughs> to be done. She'll, uh, she'll be joining us soon. And uh, um, Professor Peterson today will be speaking about a, a um, project he's been involved in with uh, um, a colleague, Richard Vokes, and the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, um, titled Making Revolutionary Film in Idi Amin's Uganda, Propaganda and Peril. Um, usually, the way we organize these seminars, the presenter will have about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, basically not keeping time, but however however long you'd, you'd like to take in that ballpark. Um, followed by um, a questions, comments from uh, the discussant uh, for about five, 10 minutes. And then the floor is open to the audience for questions uh, and, uh, and discussion. So for those online, if you could just stay uh, on mute until we get to the question and answer period, that would be uh, very much appreciated. And then use the raise hand button or just type your comment into the chat. And, uh, and we will... Uh, get to you in the order that I that I see hands. So, um, with that, I really just want to uh, to welcome Professor Peterson and Dr. Adima here, and uh, hand the floor over to Professor Peterson for the presentation. Right. Thank you very much, Edgar Taylor, and uh, the Department of History and Heritage Studies for having me here. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be asked to talk, and uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to to speak with you. Um, I'm here in Kampala in part um, to help organize a, an exhibition to which I want to call your attention, if you don't mind, uh, an exhibition that's being launched uh, on Saturday this weekend and will carry forward through to the end of October. It's uh, organized largely by colleagues at Uganda Martyrs University in Nkosi, um, and it concerns the history of the Uganda Martyrs. The 60th anniversary of their canonization uh, takes place in October this year. Myself and colleagues from the Archdiocese of Kampala and from UMU have organized an exhibition that features the relics of Proroli Luanga, Matias Mulumba, and others that were brought back to Kampala on uh, two days ago, as you may have seen in the news. Um, the exhibition will put these relics on show alongside photographs and historical documents that myself and my colleagues have been assembling. Um, it will be at the Rubaga campus of UMU, which is just downhill from the cathedral. The uh, opening events on the 14th are targeted, <clears throat> are targeted toward folks who are particularly tied up with, uh, um, you have important positions in government and such. If you'd like to come on the 14th, you're most welcome, but it will be a long uh, occasion. Uh, <laughs> the real public opening is the following day on Sunday the 15th, when the general public is very welcome to come um, and view the exhibition. There's a film that I've put together featuring historical footage. There's a whole bunch of old photographs from the Vatican that we've dug out of archives. There's uh, historical documents that likewise shed light on the circumstances of the martyr's canonization in 1964. So uh, do come if you've got time. With that as a sales pitch, let me get into the substance of my uh, talk for today. Um, <clears throat> okay, so 
I'm going to talk today to work that myself and my colleague Richard Vokes from the University of Western Australia have been engaged in for these past several years. Focus on our shared effort to um, digitize the analog media assets of the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. UBC uh, is the state broadcaster. It inherited uh, the recordings, the video films, the sound recordings, the photographs, and the archives of the Ministry of Information, which turn out to be very extensive and voluminous. Idi Amin was the, um, the architect, really, of the kind of high point in the Ministry of Information's work. He was constantly attended by photographers like these men who worked with the Uganda Film Unit and the Photographic Unit, taking photographs and making films of his deeds as president of Uganda between 71 and 1979. In 2017, colleagues at UBC, along with my colleague Richard, found a filing cabinet stuffed full of photographic negatives, which date, most of them date, from the 1970s. Since that time, we've digitized about 50,000 out of a collection of 85,000 photographic negatives. Dr. Taylor was at one time very vitally involved in this work. Um, that uh, work, in turn, gave rise to follow-on work focusing on the sound records of the, um, the sound recordings of the UBC on their vinyl music collection, which turns out to be very extensive, and also on their cinema film collection, which is the subject of today's paper. Um, there are about a hundred, or there have been about a hundred cinema films in the storehouse, in the storerooms of the UBC, which my colleagues and I uh, have um, brought out of the UBC building in large part because the humidity and the exposure to heat have caused the rapid degradation of the celluloid film. Celluloid is very fragile. Unlike paper, it degrades quickly if it's exposed to humidity. Um, the cinema films of the UBC have been very uh, kept in very poor conditions, exposed to damp, uh, dust, and other maladies. So with the express encouragement of the UBC and with the involvement of UBC leadership, we brought um, 100 reels to Michigan a few years ago. We've digitized thus far 35 of those reels and are now looking for funding to enable us to digitize the remaining 65. The talk today is focused on two films that come out of this larger collection of 35 that we've brought into digital media. President Idi Amin came to power in 1971 and he sought to frame his government as revolutionary and anti-colonial. But it was, his, it, was his, his, yeah, it was his misfortune to govern a place that was, in fact, far from the theater of anti-colonial or anti-imperial struggle. Ian Smith, John Vorster, the apartheid state, these were all far away. They didn't share a border with Idi Amin's Uganda. There was no military conflict that could shape and characterize Idi Amin's wars of liberation. In the absence of military valor, Amin's regime had to create its own liberation wars. Over the course of the 1970s, his regime launched and sustained campaigns against a great many Ugandan minorities, Ugandan Asians, Israelis, Acholi and Langi people, Pentecostal and Evangelical Christians, independent women, smugglers, and other economic nonconformists, all were subject to campaigns or wars that were meant to, in some sense, liberate Uganda from outsiders' malign influence. All at once, unsuspecting minorities were defined as foreign oppressors, as servants of an overseas power. Everywhere there was violence, as a means government targeted particular communities for reform, for punishment, for incarceration, or for exile. This inhumanity was in its conception anti-colonial and anti-imperial, it was, in the eyes of its advocates, meant to free Uganda from the control of foreigners. All of this placed extraordinary pressure on the makers of official media. If Uganda's government was to be revolutionary, if it was to be engaged in anti-colonial struggle, then it needed evidence. And it was the task of filmmakers, photographers, and media professionals to make inhumanity look heroic, to make demagoguery appear visionary, to make political violence seem to be purposeful. It was through anti 
it was through rather state-run propaganda, through film, through photography, through journalism, and through radio, that Amin's regime made its liberation wars visible. It was in media, more than in real life, that Uganda could be seen to be at war. But revolutionary content was always in short supply. Amin's campaigns were fought out of public view, behind closed doors, insights that were obscure and hard to see. The protagonists were often deliberately invisible. They were secretive security men whose bloody work was convened, conducted in military barracks or in underground cellars in Nakasero. They were bureaucrats whose field of operation was in property ownership, in building permits, passport control, and other arenas of civil administration. None of this made for particularly good theater. The campaigns that the Amin government pursued were not particularly inspiring to look at. Revolutionary occasions had to be fabricated, organized, and curated. Anti-colonial imagery had to be conjured up through stage management. It needed, in other words, a confident narrator to tell the audience what to see in scenes that were otherwise unremarkable and unprepossessing. Cinema film was an enduringly useful medium by which to contrive victories that were otherwise hard to visualize. So in this essay, Richard and I have reconstructed the creative work of the Uganda Film Unit, which was the government entity under the Ministry of Information that was responsible for the creation of Idi Amin's cinema films. The men of the Uganda Film Unit used film to generate proof for themselves and for outsiders that could represent the victories that had been won. In their carefully made films, they, contrive, they could control a narrative impelling viewers to see revolutionary deeds in unremarkable and disconnected footage. By the later 1970s though, as I'll describe in the second part of this paper, even the men of the film unit felt themselves endangered by the rising tide of indiscriminate violence. They lost, that is, the moral clarity and political confidence necessary to create revolutionary film. Okay, so the most infamous campaign that Idi Amin's government launched was called the Economic War. In August 1972, as many of you know, the president announced the summary expulsion of Uganda's South Asian community. Over 50,000 Ugandan Asians, as they were called, were given some three months to pack up their lives and leave the country. Many of them had lived in Uganda for generations. Businesses and buildings that the Asians had owned were handed over to African proprietors. Amin first called it the War of Economic Independence. Later, it was renamed the Economic War. In the speech that announced it, he argued, as he said, that Ugandan Africans have been enslaved economically since the time of the colonialists. The economic war was, quote, meant to emancipate the Af Ugandan Af Africans of this republic. This is the day of salvation for the Uganda Africans. This is the day of redemption for the Ugandan Africans. All Ugandans must wake up in full and total mobilization, determined and committed to fight this economic war until it is won. By the end of 1972, 5,600 farms, ranches, and estates that Ugandan Asians had owned were vacated and black African proprietors had been appointed to take over black Asian-run businesses. In practice, the liberation of Uganda's economy was a straightforwardly bureaucratic exercise. It involved, that is, the reallocation of thousands of properties formerly owned by Asians into the hands of black Ugandan proprietors. There were reams of paper that had to be created. Departing Asians had to fill in declarations describing the properties they'd vacated. African applicants likewise had to fill in extensive forms to claim businesses that they wished to take control of. None of this was particularly dramatic. No blood was spilt in the economic war. No one died in the course of the Asian expulsion. There were no martyrs to him. In the still photographic archive, one can see the curators of Idi Amin's revolutionary image struggling, really, to find a photographic subject. 
In one series of interesting photographs, President Amin lectures a room full of bureaucrats responsible for organizing the redistribution of vision-owned properties. In the picture, the president gestures widely while bureaucrats scribble furiously in notebooks. That wasn't particularly interesting to look at either. In another series of photographs, which is on the screen here, black Ugandan proprietors who are applying for ownership over, or at least for proprietorship over eight vacated Asian businesses are queuing up outside such businesses to stake their claim. Again, standing in line, not particularly heroic, and there's nothing particularly inspiring about queuing up. A third series of photographs, which I particularly like, was made at the Ministry of Commerce and Industries offices in Kampala. It features a room full of civil servants filling in forms. These are thick files, no doubt full, of papers that Asian proprietors have filled in describing their businesses. These bureaucrats are probably, I presume, making decisions about which applicant will get control of which property. In the photographic series, uh, a person who I presume is their manager is gesturing at the bureaucrats with Idi Amin looming over their shoulder. And the man in the corner here is looking at the camera with something that to me looks like frustration or disgust. I particularly like this image that captures to some extent the, what do you call it, the kind of bureaucratic tangles that the Asian expulsion actually entailed. Government cameramen, in other words, were always searching for photographic images that could in some sense capture the Asian expulsion as if it were heroic and revolutionary and liberatory. Their most successful series of photographs was made at the Aga Khan Mosque in November 1972, a means men discovered more than 1.8 shillings tucked away in a wall and in the ceiling of the mosque. The Asian man who had hoarded the cash, who's shown here in the photograph, was paraded in front of the cameras. And over the course of an afternoon, the money was stacked up, rearranged, counted, and restacked in front of the cameras. There's a series of about 25 still photographs in this particular packet depicting this occasion in which this poor man was made to pose in a variety of scenarios with all the money that he ostensibly uh, um, hoarded. In each of these photographs, the hapless Asian person poses with the money. In one series, he poses with Idi Amin himself, who appears on the scene to lecture the Asian person about his wrongdoing. The following day, the favorite photograph was pictured, uh, the chosen photograph at least, was, was uh, published on the front page of the Ugandan Argus, which was the government newspaper in those days, under the title that you can see on the screen. All of this scene setting suggests that Idi Amin's men must have felt that their photographs in themselves could not tell the stories they wanted to tell. Still photographs, in fact, don't tell their own stories. In stage managing the arrangement of cash and people, Amin's official cameramen were trying to, in some sense, overcome the inherent limits in the still photographic medium. They were creating photographic sequences or scenes or something like a photographic essay that could illuminate the venality of the regime's enemies. But they must have known that the photos themselves were never enough. It takes other elements, in this case, a headline, to tell the viewer what to see in a photographic image. There are no labels that in here in still photography and there's nothing in a still photograph that tells you what's happening in it. This must have frustrated the still photographers. That's why I think cinema film became for the Amin government a source of fascination and an enduring place in which the government invested its funds. It was in documentary film that the drama of Uganda's liberation could actually come to life. In motion pictures, as opposed to still photography, a means filmmakers could structure their own narrative around otherwise contestable and ambiguous images, directing viewers' attention, shaping their interpretation of what's happening. Cinema could transform even the most pedestrian scene into an illustration of big and grand ideas. The architect of the Uganda Film Unit's revolutionary cinema was this man, his name was Serafinis Gamba Otieno, who made film under the name Sao Gamba. 
Otieno, or Sao Gamba as he preferred to be called, was born in Kenya but raised largely in Uganda. As a youth, he had developed an interest in cinema while studying in Kenya. After studying there, he went on to Poland, where in 1964 he entered the prestigious Lotz Film School, which was a kind of birthplace for a whole generation of left-leaning documentary filmmakers. Gamba was the first person from sub-Saharan Africa to enroll in this Polish film school. And there he learned the techniques of socialist cinema. In particular, he seems to have learned how to use what filmmakers call the voice of God, that is, the ex-cathedra narrator who stands outside the cinematic shot and tells the reader what's happening in it. He seems to have learned how to do that cinematically from the Lot School, because the student films that he made always feature the so-called voice of God booming through the film. I don't have time to talk his student, about his student films, but they are very interesting. So in 1971, Gamba, having finished his studies in Poland, came back to East Africa. Later in life, he would tell a sympathetic biographer that Idi Amin's man had kidnapped him from the village and brought him to Kampala to work for the Uganda Film Unit. I don't think that's actually true. Sao Gamba's films, even if he was enrolled in the Uganda Film Unit under a if you've been kidnapped, there's nothing in the films to suggest anything other than enthusiasm for the job. His most successful film, at least the film that we have found thus far that's most gripping, I think, is called Uganda's Economic War. It's a 29-minute documentary film shot in color. There's no diegetic sound, that is, no original sound anywhere in the film. Instead, the film is set up with Gamba, the filmmaker, as the narrator. That is, there's no, pre there's no sound that comes from the scenes itself. Instead, everything was done in the studio with Gamba narrating uh, from scene to scene. Let me show you here the opening bars of uh, Uganda's economic war. Not the right one. Um, here we are. OK, so here's the opening bars of uh, Uganda's economic war narrated by Sao Gamba. Excellency, the President, General Idi Amin Dada, told his people that the lowering of the British flag in 1962 marked the achievement of Uganda's political independence. But his government had realized that this, without economic independence, was meaningless. They therefore, in the second decade, had to take steps, regardless of the dangers, against the imperialists and Zionists who controlled the economy. Only in this way could Uganda's own citizens participate in the management of their country's wealth. It should always be remembered, he said, that the tasks ahead are not easy ones. We should concentrate and fix our minds on the ultimate goal, for it is a noble one. We should resolve, he said, to do our best for God and our country. The declaration has at last come after so many years of Cold War. Uganda is at war, economic war. The imperialists and their agents have been kicked out of their seats, and Ugandans have come out wholeheartedly in support of His Excellency General Idi Amin Dada, the President of the Second Republic of Uganda. The brave general has made up his mind. He would not sit down and watch his people tormented by the colonialists, neo-colonialists, and Zionists. country's economy must be run by citizens. All non-citizen Asians must leave within 90 days, the president declared at Tororo Army Barracks on his way from Iriri, the provincial town of Karamoja. Okay, so I'm going to stop this part here. We'll come back to Uganda's economic war in a sec. Second, rather. Um, so a few things to notice about that opening scene. 
for one thing, nothing in that opening scene has to do with the economic war at all. That is the scene at the end with folks dancing around uh, in a traditional style is undoubtedly one of the hundreds of occasions in which Ugandans were obliged to assemble before their president and perform traditional dances in the guise of culture and tradition. Uh, it's Sao Gamba, not the event itself, that tells you that's actually people celebrating the economic war. It's through the narrator, not through the scene itself, that the viewer is obliged to see Ugandans celebrating the announcement in August 1972 of the expulsion of the Asians. Likewise, the opening scene on the streets of Kampala with the traffic policemen directing cars through uh, Kampala Avenue um, is a scene that, you know, it's an unprepossessing scene that has no particular connection with the economic war. It's an everyday urban scene in Kampala that, again, Sao Gamba, the narrator, uses to kind of orient the viewer toward the events of 1972. The only real event in this whole half an hour long film that actually has to do with the economic war is the scene that I'm about to show you. On the 8th of August, 1972, as martial music plays, as you'll see, <clears throat> an ensemble of foreign diplomats disembarked from their limousines to attend a luncheon at Command Post, which was Idi Amin's residence at administrative headquarters in Kololo. It was until recently the North Korean embassy. The British High Commissioner, the Indian High Commissioner, the Pakistani Ambassador, and others are present. As international journalists ask questions, President Amin confronts the diplomats with his decree, Ugandan Asians have 90 days to leave the country. This scene, as you're about to see, is the visual core of the scene. And again, it's the only part of the film that actually has to do with the Asian expulsion. But again, take note of the fact that there's no diegetic sound. President Amin was recorded by other journalists speaking at this luncheon, and his voice was broadcast across uh, media, both international and local media. But the filmmakers made what seems to me the intentional choice not to use native sound or diegetic sound in the making of this particular segment. So here, here we go with scene two. It was at the command post number 10 on the 8th of August 1972 where His Excellency General Idi Amin Dada, the President of the Second Republic of Uganda, invited cabinet ministers, the British High Commissioner to Uganda, Mr. Richard Slater, the Indian High Commissioner to Uganda, Mr. Daram Deva, the Pakistani Ambassador, Marshal Kalba Khan, senior government officials, leaders of the Asian community in Uganda, and many international journalists at a luncheon. Before lunch, His Excellency the President was introduced to the British and Indian High Commissioners, the Pakistani Ambassador, and also the leaders of the Asian community in Uganda. It was after lunch that His Excellency the President disclosed that he had signed a decree revoking with effect from the 8th of August 1972 all entry permits and certificates of residence which had been granted to nationals of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Asians holding British passports. He said that from that date the above persons concerned were permitted only to stay in Uganda for a maximum period of 90 days. Okay, so that's scene two that I want to highlight for today. Um, uh, the rest of the film was uh, largely set in, uh, well, the rest of the film, first of all, shows President Amin traveling around the country, uh, presenting speeches before apparently adoring audiences who always cheer and ululate, uh, at least in the sound, at his speeches. You'll notice um, in this scene, again, I pointed out that the voiceover is the predominant medium by which the viewers interpret what happens in the scene. You'll notice there's band music, too, 
that was band performing at the occasion when the diplomats came to command post. And likewise, in the scenes of enthusiasm and people dancing that make up the rest of the film, the applause lines, the cheering, the dancing music, all of it is done in the production process, not as part of the diegetic soundtrack. The final scenes in the economic form, uh, war film come at the end of the reel. They are set in Entebbe as exiled Asians queue up for departure to London. After Amin issued his decree expelling the Asian community, international journalists had sent reporters to Kampala to cover the story. In those days, the newspapers in Europe were full of images of distressed Asians packing up their possessions in boxes and suitcases and queuing up at the airport tarmac to take off for a foreign destiny that was unknown. Those photographs often featured crying children, worried and anxious adults jostling in disorderly mobs at the airport. They pictured also bereft Asian families, their furniture piled up beside the road, their lives unended. The men of the Uganda film unit seem to have been determined to counter all of that. This last scene of the film shows departing Asians waiting in orderly queues, smiling, attended by helpful and friendly officials, their baggage neatly assembled at their side. There's no evidence of violence. No one's crying. There's no signs of distress. In fact, there's no signs of dispossession at all. The narrator, Sao Gamba, tells the viewer, in a soundtrack that's quite indistinct. This last part of the film is very damaged, so you're not going to be able to make this out very well. But the, the voiceover from Sao Gamba says, um, uh, quote, the genial atmosphere among the British Asians was one of rejoicing. They all laughed proudly and joked as though the great general had won the war for him. And in the last bits of the film, the narrator says, they're enjoying this as if they're going off for a holiday in London, a place that had previously been closed to them. Here he's referring to the immigration policies of Britain in the 19, early 70s, which had limited um, the immigration of people from the former uh, British colonies. So let me just show you some of this. Again, the sound here is pretty not great, so my apologies. Over 100 who awaited their flight at Entebbe International Airport were Some were fascinated at the ideas at last they were going to break Britain thanks to his excellency, you know, for over two years for an entry voucher. And now the general had brought it to them on a plate. The general atmosphere among the British agents was that of rejoicing. They all laughed broadly and joked as though the great general had won a war for them. Some had families already in Britain and were eager to join them. Okay, so I'm going to stop this here. Um, all right, so this is one of many such occasions, one of many such films wherein the agents of the Amin government uh, sought to transform the illogic of the Asian expulsion into a bloodless victory won for black nationalism. In its structure and commentary, the film casts otherwise disconnected scenes into representations of Ugandan's victory over imperialism. All the footage, except for that scene at command post, was imported from recordings of extraneous events filmed at one of the many and diverse occasions when people assembled before their president. All the enthusiasm had to be manufactured, conjured up through the magic of the soundtrack and through inspirational imagery. Um, there's no interviews with Ugandans on the street, no man on the spot who could speak for the issues of his time. Ugandan's people were not allowed to speak on this film and importantly, neither was President Amin himself. You'll notice, that President Amin, uh, the most loquacious political leader that Uganda has ever had, is never recorded in his own voice on this soundtrack. 
The film that you've just been looking at enjoyed a wide distribution. Um, uh, and uh, we know, let's see here. We know that it was screened for President Amin in January 1973 and that he thought it was fantastic um, and pronounced it, as he said, very good. It was sent off to Lagos at the FESTAC conference. The FESTAC was the Festival of African Arts and Culture, a huge continental event in which the Nigerian government, rich with oil money, assembled thousands of artists from across the African continent and the Black diaspora to come to Lagos to show uh, what Black culture and art looked like. The Amin government sent the economic war film to Lagos where it was apparently screened. I don't have any information, unfortunately, from, you got, from Nigerian audiences about what, what they made of this film. But I do know that it was sent to London because there's a film archive called the Funley Archive that owns a slightly altered version of the same film in its collection. So film then was a medium in which Uganda's violent politics could be made to seem revolutionary. Over the course of the 1970s, the film unit seems to have made a number of similar films only a few which we digitized, which was also directed by Sao Gamba, which we have screened, and it's made very much in the same style, we have digitized rather, and it's made very much in the same style as the film you've just watched. The films that were also made in the early 70s likewise reflect this kind of revolutionary um, uh, enthusiasm, although we haven't yet actually laid eyes on them as uh, it's been difficult to get the film stock uh, digitized for financial reasons, largely. Um, um, I don't have time here to talk about the distribution of this film within Uganda. Suffice it to say that Ugandan audiences likewise assembled before movie screens to watch this movie. The Amin government encouraged local governments to buy movie projectors and outfit movie theaters in district headquarters where Ugandan citizens would come to watch films such as this, which were sent up from Kampala uh, at cost for the purpose of ginning up enthusiasm for Amin's regime. Film watching was part of the routine by which rural people engaged with Idi Amin's government. As the 1970s wore on though, government filmmakers seemed to have become uncertain about their work. Film that was once intended to be revolutionary can look inhumane when viewed in retrospect, can be seen as comedy and as ridic ridiculous by unsympathetic viewers. For the men of the Uganda Film Unit, it became progressively more difficult. The 1970s went on to know how and on what terms to represent the victories that had been won. A key moment in the transformation of the film unit's history was the making of this movie. This is not a Uganda film unit movie. This is a film made by a filmmaker named Bar made a film that's called General Edian an Encouragement of President Amin himself. Um, that is, President Amin uh, directed Uganda government authorities to cooperate with the filmmaker Schrader in the making of this movie. And he himself appears in several scenes directing the camera, you know, pay, calling attention to particular things that the cameraman ought to focus on. Barbet Schrader's film was meant and seems to have been conceived by, by President Amin as a kind of work of propaganda. But when Schrader's film was actually screened first at the Cannes not to be in prayer to President Amin as a kind of comedy act. News reporters who were present at screenings of Schrader's films in France and Italy laughed uproariously at scenes that President Amin had thought were meant to impress viewers with the seriousness of his political and military successes. One reporter rep said that um, Audience's reaction was said to be halfway through the laughter at a Marx Brothers comedy and gasps at the feats of King Kong. Another film crit critic called Idi Amin, quote, the funniest star since Woody Allen. Audiences in Europe laughed at Idi Amin's English, at his stilted manner of marching, at his pomposity, 
Amin heard about European audiences' reactions to Schrader film. Enraged, he telephoned French President Discard d'Estaing and threatened harm to Uganda's French economy community, rather, if cuts were not made to the film. The director, Schrader, hastily came to Kampala, screened the film for President Amin, and made, at Idi Amin's direction, five cuts in the film, uh, cutting out several scenes that Idi Amin thought to be uncomplimentary to his government. For Ugandan filmmakers, more than for people like Barbet Schrader and other foreigners, making films about President Amin was a dangerous thing, particularly in the mid to later 70s. That's why in the years following the enthusiasm of the Asian expulsion, the revolutionary ambitions of the Uganda film unit were dramatically scaled down. The filmmaker that I was talking about for the past uh, half an hour or so, Sao Gamba, the maker of Uganda's economic war, left Uganda in 1973 and went to work for the uh, Kenya Film Corporation, where he went on to have a distinguished career as an artist, um, and as a filmmaker. In 1975, he bought, brought out an important documentary film called People of the Red Ochre about Kenya's Maasai community. In 1978, he made a complimentary film about uh, Kenyan President Jomo Kenyatta. Thereafter, he helped to found one of Kenya's most important art collectives uh, and had a distinguished career as a painter and as a sculptor. In Sao Ugamba's absence, the men of the film unit seem to have lost their sense of revolutionary direction. The films that the film unit made in 1974 tell us something about the shrinking of the Uganda film unit's ambition. The titles were, quote, The Use of Forests. Another was Health and Child Welfare. A third was The Office of the Chief Government Chemist. The fourth was Traffic Control at Entebbe Airport. And the sixth was Inland Waterways. It's hard to imagine audiences queuing up for this boring set of documentary films, but that may have been, in fact, what the men of the film unit preferred to see happen. It is though they were trying to distance themselves from politics altogether and to choose the most uncontroversial subjects they could think about to make films. They were returning to the solid cinematic turf of colonial times, when the colonial film unit in the 1950s had likewise made solidly pedagogical, informative films about Uganda that were meant to instruct Ugandans about how to regard state institutions. What's remarkable to me is how quickly the film unit turned from the revolutionary ambition of 1972 to the kind of boring, earnest, cinematic, uh, what is the right way to describe it, drudgery of 1974. Their feeling of endangerment can be seen in the making of the longest film that we have so far digitized in the archives of the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. I don't know that this is in fact the largest, longest film made in the 70s, but it's the longest one that we've actually been able to digitize. This is a 50 minute black and white movie filmed in the latter months of 1975 that has, for reasons I'm about to describe, no title. The film documents the visit of a British military officer whose name was Sir Chandos Blair to Uganda. The footage is visually compelling and the filmmakers laid out the film from end to end creating what seems to be the architecture for a narrative that they later hoped to append to the visual imagery, but they never completed their work. The film was laid out, the, the, uh, the original clips were uh, spliced together, uh, sequences were arranged, lots of editing went into the making of the visual footage, but no one ever recorded a soundtrack. And neither is there a credits uh, roll at the front or a title card at the, at the front or a credits roll at the end. They presumably intended to make a voiceover to the film, but they abandoned the making of the film nearly complete before the necessary work could be done. So the last part of this lecture, I want to talk about why it was that in 1975, in the last months of that year, the men of the, law, the film unit lost their courage in the making of this black and white film. It's not that they didn't have lots of material to work with. 
General Blair had come to Uganda to plead for the life of this man, Dennis Hills, who was a university lecturer arrested and put on trial before a military tribunal for writing a book called um, uh, uh, White Pumpkin, which had called President Amin, quote, Black Nero and, quote, a village tyrant. Radio Uganda called Dennis Hill's book anti-Uganda propaganda. And President Amin put Dennis Hills, the author, on trial before a military tribunal in Bombo, accusing him of sedition. In legal terms, it was not a convincing case. In one of the opening scenes, which I'll show you in a minute, judges listen solemnly while the prosecuting attorney makes the case against the author. The prosecutor fumbles with his papers, looking uncertainly at the page. Hills appears to speak with confidence in front of the camera and in front of the military judges. For reasons I think probably to do with the nature of this interaction, the film in this opening sequence is silent, even though the setting, which was a small courtroom, would have lent itself to diegetic recording. There's no reason why they wouldn't have used original sound in the opening scene, but it seems likely that filmmakers feared giving Dennis Hills, who seems to have been quite convincing, a voice in the proceedings. Whatever the merits, whatever happened in that courtroom, the military tribunal duly sentenced Dennis Hills to death by a firing squad. President Amin vowed that the sentence would be carried out at Mutineers Park, as it was called, which is a valley just near Nakasero um, in the city center, the same ground where in 1898, the British had executed 27 Sudanese soldiers who'd mutinied against their British officers. So the British government sent General Chandos Blair to rescue the situation. Chandos Blair had been the commanding officer of the 4th Battalion of the King's African Rifles. And in that context, he'd recommended Lieutenant, e sorry, he'd recommended Sergeant Edi Amin for pr promotion to second lieutenant. That is, he was the officer who made Edi Amin into a military, um, on, on his kind of military path toward becoming a uh, brigadier and later major general. British authorities hoped that this early acquaintance between General Blair and Uganda's president would give Blair leverage over Uganda's leader. But an hour after General Blair landed in Entebbe Airport, President Amin flew in a helicopter to Arua in northern Uganda, a long way away from Entebbe. And he didn't invite General Blair to go with him. Blair and his traveling companions were obliged to cool their heels in Kampala, awaiting an audience with the president. Now, the paragraph I'm about to read to sort of describe for you is speculation, but it seems to me that for the cameraman of the film unit, the several days that General Blair spent waiting in Kampala was an opportunity for cinematic creativity. They spent the time, that is, staging scenes that could embarrass the general and represent Uganda's victory over British colonial rulers. And you can kind of imagine the producers sitting in a room together thinking like, what can we come up with next? The opening scene of the film features General Blair, uh, sorry, the, it's kind of the second or third scene actually, features General Blair arriving at the airport. Over the course of 20 minutes, government journalists pepper him with questions that are plainly prescripted and meant to embarrass him. One Uganda journalist asks General Blair, how are things in Northern Ireland? Another journalist asked him, how are the people of Britain at a time when Britain was in the grips of a deep economic depression? This is the only part of the film where there is diegetic sound. Doubtless because it was here that the soundtrack itself was the whole point. It was the soundtrack in this opening press conference that was supposed to uh, make the enfeeblement the confusion, the embarrassment of the British government uh, audible and visible to audiences. Another scene takes place the following day when General Blair and colleagues were taken off to the Uganda Museum. There, General Blair was obliged to sit on a low stool, almost crouching on the ground, as men of the museum, as men and particularly women of the museum's dancing troupe gyrated directly in front of him in a very small room, in a room right in the uh, entrance to the museum's ethnographic gallery that's maybe about 15 feet across. General Blair is sitting there at a low stool below the display cases while 
Sorry to be crass, but Ugandan women are like shaking their bums right in front of him. This seems to me to be quite deliberate. In convention, as you know, in the 1970s, people of the nation sit above those that they're addressing. And Diaz is uh, looking down on the audience. In this scene, it seems to me that the filmmakers deliberately contrived a scene in which to diminish General Blair's posture and his importance and his consequence and perhaps his dignity by positioning him in a distinctly kind of embarrassing guise. And you can see General Blair kind of uncomfortably shifting around in his seat, trying to find a way out of this slightly embarrassing situation. The cameras were also rolling wing, and a few days later, President Amin finally got around to summoning uh, um, General Blair to Northern Uganda. In the scene I'm about to show you, which was recorded without diegetic sound, General Blair strides along a dirt path leading from the airstrip in Arua and pauses in front of a low grass thatched house and bends low, almost down to the ground to enter the building. And there inside the house is President Amin. President Amin is wearing a blue pinstripe suit, a Dior scarf, and brown shoes, and also, as you'll see, an enormous Mexican sombrero. Two cameramen are also inside that tiny house with a battery operated light and a little stool while General Amir, uh, Amin sits on what appears to be a throne looming over him as the two have a conversation. So here we go with this middle, this kind of, well, it's, it's kind of the scene actually in the General Bear film. So again, no native sound on the right there is Major Ian Graham, who had likewise been uh, General Amin's commanding officer in colonial times. So they're walking from the air trip to Arua to the to the the house that had been specially built for this occasion. Who so comes in and there's Edie Amin with the enormous sombrero. Okay, so the filmmaker keeps the shot on this for about, as I was saying, 10 or 15 minutes. I'm not by any means going to show you this. Um, but they seem to have gotten the camera outside for a part of the uh, exchange that actually was the kind of money shot. Um, in the uh, last part of this sequence, the cameramen are outside the hut while General Blair tries to get out. Not by mistake, General Blair is the first one out the door, even though when coming in, as you'll see, uh, the Colonel had gone in first to show him the way. So in this last scene, uh, this last scene in this sequence, General Blair bends down, goes out the door. There's both still photographers and cameramen outside the door, watching him on his knees as he crawls out under the thatch. I don't know if I have this here, I don't think I do. Anyway, um, that scene was, as it turned out, the shot that everyone was looking for. Because the following day, a still photograph of Dennis Hill, sorry, of, um, of General Blair on his knees crawling through the thatch of that building in Arua was published on the front page of The Voice of Uganda. Radio Uganda reported that General Blair and his colleague had approached President Amin on their knees, begging for clemency for Dennis Hills. Kenya's leading newspaper published a story under the headline, Hills Spared as Envoys Kneel for Amin. And even the New York Times picked up the story, publishing it under the headline, Uganda says Britons want to stay on their knees. The picture of General Blair uh, became one of a small ensemble of photographs that purported to represent a means victory over Uganda's British oppressors. In 1975, the government printer published two photographs of Blair on his knees in a pamphlet containing the text of President Amin's speech before the United Nations, 
1976 um, and the years following, General Blair, sorry, General Amin, was to use the house in Arua as a kind of destination where visiting dignitaries would come to sort of visit the site of General Blair's humiliation. So in this way, the humiliation of the British general passed into um, uh, global media. But assembling a film-length version of General Blair's embarrassment proved to be much harder. After his departure, um, the men of the Uganda Film Unit seemed to have worked to come up with a narration that could tell the story of the general's humiliation. And they did, as I was saying earlier, come up with an overall structure. Um, here's the opening scenes of this untitled film that, as I said, was laid out end to end, but never finished. In the opening scene, there's a firing squad, which is shown assembly, assembling on an open field under the command of a, of a Ugandan military officer, while an unknown person is tied to a tree and executed, as you'll see, with automatic weapons, all of whom train, are trained on this single poor individual. I don't know who the executed person was in this photograph, in this scene rather, but it's the opening scene in the General Blair film as it was laid out. Scene two features Dennis Hills walking along a path outside the British military, sorry, outside the Uganda Army military barracks, accompanied by, again, Uganda military officers entering into um, a contrived uh, courtroom. And here, as I was saying earlier, addressing his military judges about the merits of his case. Here again, we can see the um, prosecutor, Ugandan prosecutor, reading out uh, the argument, the prosecution's case against Dennis Hills while the military tribunal hears the evidence. This gruesome opening scene was to have been, I think, something of a foretelling of the fate that awaited Dennis Hills. It's a kind of warning, perhaps, or a kind of intimation of what awaited this uh, condemned man uh, were he to be found guilty. The producers of the film, as I, I'm not going to show you all this film because it's very long, but the producers of the film were careful in the sequences that ensued to use all the footage from General Blair's undignified visit to the Uganda Museum. The climax of the film is the scene in Arua when General Blair was obliged to bend low before the president. In other words, the whole thing was laid out. But the editors were also quite careful about what they showed. And I can tell you about two scenes that I think they must have cut out of this film as they were laying it out. One scene that they undoubtedly had footage of but that they didn't use showed General Blair swimming with General Amin. President Amin enjoyed swimming with foreign diplomats. It was a way in the early 70s that he could contrast his own military vigor and physical, physically imposing stature with the kind of scrawniness of foreign diplomats' physique. The Voice of Uganda often featured um, still photographs of General Amin without his shirt on alongside the British High Commissioner, who was not a muscular person. And it seems as though the filmmakers thought, well, we can do the same thing here with General Blair. I know from a, a, someone who is there who has published a memoir about what happened that General Amin invited General Blair and uh, his British colleague to go to a swim uh, together. Um, the British narrator who describes this sort of meeting at the swimming pool uh, was by no means complimentary toward the physique of the British military men they had, uh, as he said, um, uh, they looked like junior section commanders. But according to the British observer, the shirtless president to mean was decidedly unimpressive. By the last months of 1975, as this British observer said, the athletes and pugilist muscles had, been tur had turned to flab and great rolls of fat hung over his swimsuit. Now, it seems almost certain to me that the men of the film unit were there with their cameras rolling as they tried to get footage of General Amin alongside his British visitor, for much the same reason as other people had taken photographs, other Ugandans had taken photographs of General Amin with British diplomats in earlier years. But for whatever reason, the filmmakers didn't use that footage in laying out this film. They must have made, it seems to me, a deliberate choice not to picture the flabby President Amin in a film that they were already worried about. They were likewise worried over footage depicting 
the inelegant and argumentative climax of General Blair's visit to Uganda. The last hours in which General Blair was president in Uganda involved him coming into Idi Amin's presence to try to work out whether Dennis Hills was going to be released. President Amin unexpectedly told the British general that the author wouldn't be released until the British foreign secretary himself visited Uganda to plead for his life. General Blair was angry, turned his back on General Amin without offering his hand and walked out the room in an act of protest against President Amin's um, decision. President Amin, for his part, seems to have been shaken by this encounter. And in the moments that followed, he ranted at international journalists about General Blair. He said that General Blair was drunk, that he'd threatened a British military invasion of Uganda. And in the middle of the press conference that followed, President Amin had ordered Uganda's army to go on to high alert in expectation that the British army was imminently going to invade Kampala. This press conference was covered on Radio Uganda. It was broadcast, that is. International journalists were there taking footage of this scene. And I can tell from the footage that there are Ugandan cameramen present there too, probably cameramen from the Uganda film unit. This was part of the whole dramaturgy around Blair's visit. But again, the men who laid out this film made the decision not to include that climactic scene in the movie that they laid out. Instead, the film that they made ends on a kind of indecisive tone. The last scene in the film features General Blair conversing with his military escort at Entebbe Airport, then boarding the aircraft to fly back to London. The unhappy ending of his time with Idi Amin is nowhere pictured in the movie. I conclude that the editors of this film, whose names I don't know, could agree on the visual elements they wish to use in their movie. They wanted to highlight the enfeeblement of British colonialists, magnify Idi Amin's victories over former colonial masters. But their production process stalled after the footage was spliced and laid out together. Why did these professional men, who knew how to make movies, fail to complete the job? They seem to have been vexed by the soundtrack. It's the last part of the production. Besides, as I said, the credit roll and the title sequence that remain unfinished. Perhaps they had French audiences reaction to Barbara Schrader's film in mind as they wondered how and in what voice to describe General Blair's humiliation. They could use diegetic sound only in that opening sequence in which General Blair gave the embarrassing press conference for the Ugandan journalists. And you can imagine the sound engineers rubbing their hands together as they listened to General Blair squirm in trying to find answers to the embarrassing questions that he was asked. But it was a lot more difficult, ladies and gentlemen, to do what to do with that scene that I showed you where General Blair comes into the house and Idi Amin is there wearing a sombrero. It was the ridiculousness of that scene that must have bothered them. In the key scene of the film, the, the, the whole sort of movie leads up to this scene, President Amin is wearing a freaking ridiculous hat. The film's producers must have feared that audiences would laugh like many of you did on seeing that sequence. At the moment of his triumph, President Amin looks ridiculous. We will never know why the film unit people, why the men of the film unit stalled in laying out the soundtrack. I can tell you that Sao Gamba, the confident maker of the film I showed you earlier, was already gone. In his absence, no one seems to have had the conviction and courage to transform these, um, these images, which are intrinsically hilarious, into a revolutionary movie. The men of the film unit must have known how easily the hero can become the stooge. They must have known how easily the hero can become the butt of the joke, the object of viewer's derision, the subject of mockery and ridicule. They must have known, like audiences in France had done in 1973-74, um, 74 rather, that uh, ridicule is uh, an embarrassment for the subject of the film and for them, potentially a death sentence. In its unfinished form, the General Blair film helps us glimpse the anxiety that must have crippled the men of the film unit as they sought to finish off a film that they had spent so much time laboring over. 
Let me very briefly take you through the final bars here. I'll just briefly say for reasons of time, um, because we want to get on to, to the next part of this uh, seminar, that um, uh, Idi Amin fell from power in April 1979. In 1980, the Ministry of Information's cameramen shifted from uh, celluloid to what were called umatic tapes in recording state functions. Today, there are thousands of umatic tapes from the 1980s in the archives of the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. Umatic tapes were kind of predecessors to VCR tapes. Um, again, there are thousands of them from the 80s and 90s in the UBC's inventory, and we haven't as yet figured out how to go about getting them digitized because the machinery by which to play umatic tapes is now obsolete. With this shift in recording technology from 1980 onwards, celluloid film became obsolete. And the sound, in, sorry, the movie projectors in Uganda's government possession were junked uh, because no one was making celluloid film anymore. After 1979, there was no ready-made audience for the films that filmmakers had made in, 19, in the 70s about Idi Amin's heroism. That's how the 16 millimeter films shot by the film unit became anachronisms. The reels were placed in a storeroom at the Ministry of Information's headquarters in Nakasero in 2006, when the building was purchased by a private developer, the film reels were moved to the UBC's headquarters in Nile Avenue and placed in a room adjoining the disused photographic dark room. And it was there that they laid until the late 2010s when my colleagues and I, with the support of our universities, signed an MOU with UBC's leadership. And as I said earlier, brought 100 film reels to Michigan where we've been working with little bits of money over the ensuing years to get the films digitized. The hope is that we'll be able to use the digitized films to create a open access, freely available resource where viewers can see these movies and interpret them within their historical context. Thus far, we haven't secured the funding to allow us to actually do that. Um, we did put some of these films on show in, an, in a photographic exhibition that we laid on in the Uganda Museum in 2019-2020. This exhibition was called The Unseen Archive of Idi Amin, film from the Uganda, photographs from the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. Um, and it was a, a photographic exhibition that featured still images shot by the Uganda Photographic Unit in the 70s. The exhibition was on show in Kampala for uh, eight months. It then moved to Arua and to Soroti right before the COVID pandemic shut everything down. We have in the years since COVID carried on digitizing the UBC's film stock. As I was saying earlier, we've got 32 reels digitized mostly with funding from Michigan University of Western Australia or from a private film producer called Reflex. Um, we remain uncertain to do what to do with the films that we have scanned. Um, we are careful like the men of the film muted itself, we're not only careful, we're worried about how audiences will interpret these films. As I argued, the men of the film unit were crippled by uncertainty about how audiences re would respond to their revolutionary movies. Likewise, we, as curators of the cinema movies, are concerned that these works of propaganda will be seen by Ugandans as a reinforcement for the greatness of Idi Amin, as evidence of the successes of Amin's government. The problem for us is that these films are too convincing. There's no images of dead bodies. There's no scenes of torture. There's no visible violence at all. The atrocities of the 1970s are nowhere visible in the films that the Uganda Film Unit made in those days. In a time of widespread violence, the men of the film unit made a cinema of common purpose and of political and moral resolve. They produced films that made the violence of the times, as I've argued, seem revolutionary. It's the enduring attraction of these films that is for us both a pressing educational challenge and also a source of anxiety. We're hoping if we can get the funding to put these films on a low re in low resolution form on a secure server and to create educational resources that will pop up as the films are on the screen, asking viewers to click through to archival sources, autobiographies, or interviews that will shed light on the real life 
of Ugandans as they experienced in the 1970s. But all of that takes funding and time, and thus far we haven't been able to pull it off. And moreover, more importantly, we don't quite know how to handle all this material. Um, we hope to undermine the propagandistic and seductive nature of these propagandic films. We want to undermine, that is, the sonorous, confident narration of Sao Gamba to deprive these films of their power to persuade. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that they're too convincing. I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that fascinating uh, presentation and uh, and set of images. And I just want to hand it over to Dr. Adima for uh, for the uh, for five to ten minutes uh, of questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Peterson. I'm sure I speak on behalf of the entire audience um, that this was a really fascinating topic. And thank you, Dr. Taylor, for the invitation again. Um, personally, I find the entire topic and the use of film as a historical source um, very fascinating, especially because it's, to my knowledge, quite underutilized in Ugandan historiography. I mean, for obvious reasons, film is and always has been an expensive project. It's expensive to make a film and, you know, in a country where culture budgets are always, always very limited, um, it makes complete sense that we don't really have, as historians, we don't have the opportunity to use film as a source. Um, and I think you make a very compelling case for the fraught nature of making revolutionary film um, and especially you know using Idi Amin's dictatorship as an example and to me it's very reminiscent of Hitler and Nazi Germany propaganda films and the use um, Leni Riefenstahl um, as the filmmaker um, and I think it's a very fascinating study in the dictator's use of film as a medium um, I especially like the example of Sao Gamba, the Kenyan, can I call him Kenyan or Ugandan, Ugandan-Kenyan um, filmmaker, because to me it also highlights the role that Kenyans played in Ugandan art and politics after independence. If you look at, for instance, Ungui Othiongo's play, The Black Hermit, that was staged at the National Theatre in November 1962. It was the first African play to be staged at the National Theatre and also um, the independent statue in town, which was um, created by George Maloba, a Kenyan student here at the Margaret Trowell Institute for Fine Arts, um, or back then it was known as the Makere Department for Fine Arts or something. Um, and to me, it just highlights, um, go, looking at East African regionalism, the role Kenyans played in Ugandan post-colonial cultural life. Um, I was particularly intrigued by your argument of the fabrication of revolution for content. And um, looking at the scenes, it was interesting to see um, the economic war. It was in itself not inherently violent. It was mostly just signing pieces of paper. Um, but And so it's very interesting looking at the dichotomy between what we know now with the violence and the quotidian violence of the Amin's regime, especially in Kampala, in contrast with those images. It was um, very intriguing to see. And also, I mean, we all know it's when you make a film, it's not just important what's in front of the camera, but also who is behind the camera um, is equally as important in film production. Looking at camera crew, um, sound crew, editors, all of those factors that go into even budget, who, who determines the budget, all of those factors go into making a film. So I was very interested in your interpretation of the editorial choices, especially for the untitled 15-minute film um, featuring General Blair's visit to Uganda. Um, I have a few questions that are mostly based around my personal interests, so I'll abuse my privilege as a discussant in posing them to you. Um, so you mentioned briefly about the Ugandan locals authorities involvement in distribution and reproduction of films. Um, and then you also talked about how Barbette Schroeder's film, Idi Amin, a self-portrait was screened at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, and I know you didn't mention it because of time, but were the films do you know the reaction when the films are screened to Ugandan public? Because you'd mentioned there were screened in rural areas, but I'd still be interested, especially given the fact that they were in English and to rural area, people in rural areas who might not necessarily speak English, how their um, perception of the films were, especially because being based away from Kampala, where the bulk of Amin's violence took place, what their perception would have been um, and whether they had the intended propagandist effect. Um, 
I'm also interested, um, touching what I said earlier about the use of film um, as a medium for propaganda by dictators. Um, do you know of any similar examples of African dictators using film as a medium propaganda in that period in particular? Um, looking at Mobutu in Zaire in particularly, or even you know in West Africa, looking at Nguema in Equatorial Guinea or Sekuture in Guinea. Um, are there any patterns that we can observe in propaganda styles and in film production or any comparisons and contrasts that we can draw? And um, I'm also um, interested in, maybe this is because I'm a cultural historian, um, in the use of film uh, film as an art form, because you use it now as a political source, but it is also a piece of art and a work of art. So I'd be in interested to know if you've t um, talked or engaged with any cultural or film historians on this, um, or potentially filmmakers and artists as well, um, and their thoughts on this. Um, and yeah, where would that fall within a cultural historiography of Uganda and Africa more broadly? Um, and finally, I think my favorite part of the paper was your um, or your thoughts on what to do with the films now that we have them. Um, and I think it, you know, it falls within a broader discourse around how to use questionable and problematic sources today. Um, looking in Germany, debates around how to use Mein Kampf in teaching and in public education. Um, I mean, personally, I think there should be a very large element of education in when these films are made public because I've observed a very worrying trend amongst Ugandans youth online in peddling a very revisionist history of Amin's regime that trivializes the atrocities. Um, I think recently I saw a TikTok video of a pop historian basically regurgitating facts that she read on Wikipedia. Um, and it is very worrying, it goes back to the lack of public education around this. Um, I mean, personally, I think it would be very interesting if you know, in an ideal world, if you get the funding for this, um, to involve as many, to borrow the NGO language, stakeholders as possible. Um, also stakeholders from Uganda, not just historians such as yourself, but also educators, public historians, um, and also film professionals, filmmakers, directors, and other artists involved in that field. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to co combine that brain power, if you will, to create a roadmap for the educational element around how the film should be made public. Um, and I think especially in Uganda, it, this is probably the most important aspect because there is collective amnesia around basically everything that happened before 1986. Um, there is no public or no state efforts to lead public reckoning to commemorate or remember um, the atrocities that happened under Obote and Amin's regime. Um, so and I think this would be a very important step in that direction. Um, I'll stop now because you're not here to listen to me and I'm sure the audience has many questions for you. So thank you again for that. Thanks very much for all of those questions. And I think if you wanna take on a few of those, however many you feel able to address right now, and then we'll take a round of uh, questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Adima. Those were really lovely questions. Um, I'll take them in order. The first one you asked was to do with how audiences in Uganda reacted to them. Uh, so film distribution in Uganda was uh, a very substantial um, budgetary challenge. It's expensive to make celluloid films. Buying film stock um, was always a difficult challenge at a time when foreign exchange was in short, short supply. Distribution was likewise a real challenge. Um, the Uganda government had to ask foreign embassies to pay for cinema films that they wished to acquire in order to receive some kind of income to balance the budget. And particularly as the 70s wore along, the Amin government increasingly asked local people to contribute from their own resources for the purchase of sound projectors, video film projectors, screens, and other gear that one needs to view a film. Unlike radio, which is a relatively cheap medium, to produce, and which was in fact really the radio was the real uh, engine for governance in the 1970s. Radio was the medium of record for your means to administration. Film was costly. It took. To, it was challenging to get the films into the right hands, and I actually don't know how far audiences, how they reacted to or saw these films in the first place. Electricity was always challenging. Um, electrical supplies were often interrupted. I know that local governments did buy film projectors and did have movie theaters in Jinja, in Fort Portal, and in other localities, usually, again, financed not by the central government, but by individuals 
uh, that is folks who particularly school teachers, other people, civil servants who had to donate money out of their salaries to pay for the purchase of the gear by which to distribute Idi Amin's propaganda. In that ironic sense, it was many of the folks who were being misgoverned and victimized by Amin's regime that were obliged to fund propaganda and its making and its distribution in their locality. Um, I'm, so in other words, I don't really have much to say about your first question, except to say that its distribution itself was, is for me an ironic aspect of the story that I'm telling. Um, the second question about comparative film industries, I can say a little bit about this. Um, the digitization of African, historical African cinema film underway, unlike archival digitization, which in Uganda now has been going on for about, um, well, for over 10 years, uh, um, Uganda actually is at the forefront of archive digitization um, for reasons we can talk about later. But um, cinema film, it's a lot more ex expensive to digitize cinema films. As I've learned, tried to generate a budget to pay for, you can't just put a piece of paper on a scanner and digitize a movie. And you can't either even see what's on a film because it's shot, it, unlike a piece of paper, which you can pick up and see what it is, a film comes in a reel that cracks if you try to unwind it. So in fact, even trying to look at a film to see what's on it, if the film is degraded enough, is an act of unfaithfulness to its preservation. So that has crippled a great many um, otherwise well-intentioned archivists who lack expertise. Uganda National Archivists, with almost out exception, do not have the training to digitize cinema film uh, because it takes lots of gear, lots of chemicals, and lots of expense to make the, that, that happen. It happens that I sit on a board, it's called the Modern Endangered Archive Program, which is funded by a very earnest foundation based in the US and housed at the University of California, Los Angeles, that's been slowly doling out money to digitize different uh, cinematic film archives. So I can say that in Ghana and in Malawi, there's the prospect that within the next couple of years, we will see for the first time digitized archives of official media, uh, films that is. The Ghanaian government, the Ghanaian film unit has signed on with MEAP to digitize their considerable stock of films made in the 60s and 70s. And likewise, for reasons I don't fully understand, the Malawian National Archivist has approached us and gotten funding to support digitizing several hundred films made by Hastings Banda government in the 19. 60s and 70s after Nyasaland's independence. All I can tell you, Ghana, is that the titles of the films that are on the inventories that I've looked at suggest that particularly for Ghana, the content is likely to be not dissimilar to what I've just been talking about for Amin. That is, the filmmakers in the Gold Coast or Ghana were making films in the 60s before Nkrumah's overthrow that seemed to have cast Kwame Nkrumah as a hero of liberation in a way that's not unlike that first film I showed you today looked, but we haven't seen these films because they haven't been digitized. It would be fascinating to know if there was a Zairean government cinema film archive, but I don't know if anything such exists. I know that the Tanzania cinema film archive was apparently junked. Um, I expect that the Central African Republic of Jean Bedel Bukasa would have invested in a cinema film industry because the man loved the camera, but I don't know whether Emperor Bukasa was likewise behind the creation of a heroic uh, um, cinema film industry. So ask me this question in about four or five years and maybe we'll be able to say more. Um, and finally, the question you asked last about um, what to do with the films. I am completely on board with the schematic plan that you lay out. Uh, we've approached the American National uh, Endowment for the Humanities. We've approached the Council for Library and Information Sciences several times. Um, with the active support of the College of Humanities and Social Science, whose dean is no longer here, and with the support of the Chair of History, who uh, both have been very supportive of our efforts to involve Maqueda Day students and colleagues in a consultative process of creating what film scholars call metadata around these films, that we contextualize them, that we create resources, as I was saying, interviews, um, archival material, newspaper reports, uh, 
that would put the propagandistic cinema films alongside other resources. But it's kind of, um, I agree about the pressing need for resources that can challenge the shallow, um, unreflexive pro amin sentiment on social media among the younger generation of Ugandans who have no memory of the violence of the 70s and early 80s. It's a pressing concern for historians. And as you said, it reflects the shallowness of public education around political history uh, in this country. So thanks. So, so now we can uh, uh, take a few rounds of questions. I think we'll take, uh, if, if you're uh, up to it to take maybe two or three at a time so we can get as many uh, together. If you could just raise your hands if you have a question and uh, and maybe just uh, identify yourself uh, and then uh, then ask your question if you could be as brief as possible so we can get uh, as many questions as possible. I'm just going to point to who I see first. We'll take three and then uh, the next will come uh, after that. So uh, Rebecca and then and then here and then at the end. Okay. Oh, and sorry, sorry, I forgot to say for our online audience, if for those in the room, you'll have to use a uh, a microphone so so they can hear. Yeah. All right, I think I got it. Thank yeah, you. I, um, turn it on. Yeah. Oh, it's on. Thank you. Is it, is it on? Uh, it should be on. If there's a light usually on. Usually, this comes on. But... Oh. Okay. Um. We can try a different one. Mm -hmm. Okay, both of them. Have, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. Um, um, well, I hope that this is working for the online crowd. But um, first of all, thank you so much for this really interesting talk. It's really rich and like thought provoking. Um, and my questions come out of being familiar more with Sudan than Uganda, but the in the 70s. And one of the things that strikes me is the sort of tension between what sort of political theater goes down in Uganda and what an international media might look like it, and where how those intersect. And one of the reasons I'm wondering about it, um, especially thinking about the film on the economic war, is um, in 1983, when Nimeri announced the imposition of Sharia law, he, the alcohol was outlawed. And there were these series of sort of short um, films that like sort of propaganda theatrical events that they did, um, that Nimeri did to sort of impose, including um, this one day where he poured all the alcohol that had been confiscated from the city of Khartoum into the Nile, and another when he went to the Nile beer factory and fired all the workers, um, which are these sort of like weird and kind of cruel events in certain ways. But our, our theater, right, and being used for very particular political purposes. And I guess one of the questions I was wondering, because, I mean, one of the things that what I know with Didi Amin's time and power was that he did a lot of theatrical things and he was using sort of the theater and public space in interesting ways. And... To, for that to be completely outside of the realm of film and propaganda film uh, is really interesting. Um, you point to the questions of um, the, the personal risk for filmmakers. Um, I wonder how, whether there are tensions also in how things are seen internal to Sudan and, how, and out in Uganda and outside of Uganda and to what extent um, these um, the question of differing audiences matters to some of these um, question uh, the, these films. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hello, my name is Os Oese Oswan. And uh, first of all, I want to point out, uh, I want to acknowledge that you have uh, correctly pointed out something very important that governments over time in, and in different places use propaganda to shape the narratives around how they go about their business. And Idi Amin's government did that very effectively. And you also said that if it was possible to shape the narrative in such a way that we would know that this was just propaganda, that you would do it, and that maybe the problem is that the films are a bit too good. And which prompted me to wonder, because I came in a bit late, I don't know, probably you had already pointed it out, but that there was also playwrights and uh, Playwright specifically, there was one called uh, Byron Kawadwa in 1970 who was killed because he made a play called uh, Oruimbarwa Wankoko. Oruimbarwa Wankoko means uh, 
the song of the chicken. But it was uh, very critical of Amin's government and it was pointing out how how it was killing people and doing so many terrible things. The army was robbing people on the roads and all that. And I think Byron was killed. But Byron had uh, performed that play in Nigeria. Where, yes, yes. And I wanted, I wonder though if a record of something like that exists. I think that would be good to publish to alter the narrative. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll take one more at, at the end and then the others at the next round. Uh, hi, I'm Alex White. I'm a historian of um, radio and its audiences in colonial East Africa. Uh, and I'm going to follow um, follow Dr. Adima in making a rather self-interested question. Um, but I was wondering if there's anything inherent in the films that gives you a sense of how they imagine their audience and how they imagine the audiences to engage with the film. Uh, is it something that's meant to be watched silently and reverently? Is it something that's meant to be like loudly and enthusiastically engaged with? Um, and is it aimed at the mass or at a functionally much smaller cinema going public? I think the fact that it's in English might point towards the latter, but, but I'm curious um, as to your thoughts. Uh, and then finally, to what extent does this imagined audience differ from the audience to Amin's radio production? Is this reaching a different part of the population or the same population in a new way? Thank you. So, so do you want to respond to, to those three and then we'll take the next round, starting with Moses and any others whose hands and, and Herman. Okay, I'll do this. Uh, these response to these very interesting questions uh, quickly. First, um, Dr. Glade, and in fact, the second question from Oswani, uh, whose other name I didn't catch, both asked questions effectively about theater and the arts um, in the 70s, which I want to just flag up for you that. Um, the 1970s arguably were a high tide, at least the early 70s, for Ugandan theater and literature. Among other things, the Commonwealth Writers' Conference, uh, as Anna can tell us, convened here at Makeda Day in 1972. Um, some of the most illuminous, luminescent, what's the right word? Illustrious, that's the right word. Illustrious writers of their time assembled here at uh, in Makeda Day um, for the purpose of talking about what the future of African literature would look like. Um, there were panels about the preservation of oral literature. There were panels about theater uh, and its future. There was a decided call that it was the obligation of literature scholars to go out and conserve fragile and endangered uh, oral media before elders were to pass on. That was the kind of governing um, logic of the Department of English Literature in those days. And likewise, by the way, the history department was engaged in research to do with the distant origins of Uganda's past. And there were some tremendously important books published in the early 70s by Ugandan historians about the deep time history and research projects that were launched in those days about Luo speaking and Chiga speaking peoples in this department that grew out of uh, this university, reflecting, I think, a larger point that in the 70s, the Amin government's politics, unlike really the politics of the 60s, were inclined toward the valorization and conservation of what uh, people in state thought to be the endangered artifacts of traditional culture. One aspect of the wars of liberation, as I called them earlier, that the Amin government sought to fight was to do with this investment, really, in the conservation of fragile oral literary resources, traditional folk tales, dances, and other media forms. So one reason why um, those films that we've just been watching depicted Amin in proximity to traditional dances was that this was part of the kind of intellectual and political apparatus of the day. The conservation of traditional dance went hand in hand with the liberation of Uganda's economy and culture from foreign influence. Um, likewise, as Dr. Glade points out, President Amin himself had a taste for theater. And yes, I'll just affirm the fact that as you describe for Sudan's leader, so too was General Amin given to theatrical shows that could dramatize the stakes involved in the campaigns that he launched. Um, and uh, um, I can't really go into great length on that subject, but there's a lot to say. I don't actually know um, much about what happened to uh, Oluchi, um, Olugambu, or it's Olu, is it Oludita Lia Nkoko or Okay. Uh, there were many plays that were produced in the 70s, both critical and supportive of the Amin government. Um, and um, uh, I've been struck myself, in fact, by um, 
Ruganda's plays, which are increasingly in the 70s, uh, full of pessimism and cynicism about those years. But there were likewise, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of more far-fetched uh, fictional work that celebrated the Amin government's um, efforts to reground African cultures within the kind of logics of traditional art and music. Which brings me finally to Alex White's interesting questions, neither of which I have time to go into fully because there's a lot to say. Um, I've written a whole book in part that's about the history of radio, Radio Uganda, which was an admonitory and exhortatory media in a way that um, mirrors really what we saw in the first film that I was showing you here. Like uh, Sao Gamba, the announcers on Radio Uganda used radio to tell Ugandans how to act and how to perceive the politics of their times. Unlike the film, though, that we watched, Radio Uganda um, was increasingly, as the 70s went along, full of minutia to do with government. Uh, because bureaucratic communication on paper had increasingly broken down with the collapse of the postal system and with short supplies of paper uh, to actually type. There were no typewriters. People could rarely get out of their offices. It was in radio that authorities in Kampala and indeed authorities in the provinces communicated with people that they purported to lead. And thus, as the 70s went on, Radio Uganda's broadcasting time was increasingly given over to summons for audiences, specific people to appear in particular places at a given time. Um, bureaucratic minutia that had an audience of a very small character, but that was nonetheless broadcast over Radio Uganda um, to summon people uh, on behalf of, of administration. The fact that those films are made in English, as you were saying, and not in African languages is itself really interesting. The Obote government in the 60s had put a lot of effort into broadcasting in Ugandan languages. Um, in the very late years of the 60s and early 70s, the Obote government had secured funding to expand radio broadcasting in Uganda. And by the time Amin came to power, the new broadcasting towers that the Obote government had funded were coming online. The first one came online in late 71. Another one came online in Chigezi in 1972. By the mid 70s, Amin had the most powerful radio broadcasting service uh, in Africa, including a sound broadcasting service that was broadcasting to Europe. I can tell from having gone through Radio Uganda's archives that listeners in Kansas, uh, in Europe, in Sweden, in Mexico were writing back to Radio Uganda engineers to describe how they received Uganda Radio's signal. Um, those broadcasts, the external broadcasts were in English, but at the same time, the Obote government had put funding into creating programming for uh, Luganda, for Luchiga, uh, for Lunyoro, and for other vernacular languages. By the late 60s, my memory is that there were 12 languages being used on Radio Uganda for broadcasting purposes. And the infrastructure was set up to facilitate this. There was an English language program that went out on local channels at the same time as the local African language was likewise broadcast. Um, the vernacular language programming of the 60s and early 70s was often um, focused around moral questions and the sort of conservation of specific heritages. And I think it's for that reason that in the 70s, the language of government generally shifted toward English and not toward Luganda or even Swahili. There were some Swahili broadcasts, but largely it was in English that the Amin government laid out its revolutionary agenda in part because uh, I think both organizationally um, and also practically, it was easier to make a film like the one we've just described using the resonant terms of internationalist socialist solidarity as Sao Gamba did in this first film that we watched than it would be to harness Luganda for the purpose of revolutionary cinema. It's hard to know how to talk about Obuchusa Chusa and Simani. That doesn't have the same radical transformative. So it's hard to know how in Luchiga or in Luganda one would have talked about revolution. And I imagine broadcasters face the same problem. Uh, so next I had uh, on my list uh, Moses and then Herman. Uh, if there are other questions, please raise your hand. 
and then here, and then we'll take one more round, I hope. Thank you very much, Prof. I'm Moses from the history department. Uh, when you read the story of Amin, and then you listen to some of the stories which can be narrated from the elders, some say the situation of economic war was a bit violent. But uh, according to the film which I have seen, I've not seen something like maybe any violent issue. Uh, are the other people wrong? Always some footages which portray the violent part not captured by um, Samuel Gomba. And what happened in other parts of Uganda? Because I've seen in Kampala, but uh, I've not seen in Jinja where most of the Asians were coming from. I've not seen maybe in Masaka. I've not seen maybe in Fort Porto. What was the general situation? apart from Kampara, because in Kampara I'm seeing people are lining up to get the properties, no one is fighting, they're just recording their names and moving very happily. The Asians who are expelled, they're all so happy. So I'm wondering what really happened at that situation. Then secondly, uh, how was the economic war perceived on a global scale? I understand it was a time of Cold War politics. Uh, what was the reaction of USA? What was the reaction of Russia towards this kind of economic war? Now the Asians are expelled. I know it is a situation where now it is capitalism versus communism. What was the reaction from other parts of the continent apart from the Asians who are now expelled from Uganda? I think that's what I would like to know about. Next, it's turn. Have to take one more round. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry. I really love the scene cars in this picture. Um, mine is a simple one. Um, when General Blair went to meet, I mean, went to meet, I mean, you see, like the house. Yeah. Um, 
Thanks very much. So if you can respond to those, we'll take one more round of questions. So, you, so you'll be first in the next round okay. and then Alex and, and here. Okay, so I'll be brief in response to these very interesting questions. Um, okay, so Moses, I don't want you to believe that first film that I showed you in which the streets are clean, everyone's in order, everything is peaceful, there's no violence. That is a propagandistic image of Kampala and of Amin's government that was created by a filmmaker who wanted you to be impressed. That's the point for me. The problem about that first film and other revolutionary films that people, that Sao Gamba made in those years, um, it disguises the fact of widespread violence, state dysfunction, and other facts of life. So it's it's disbelieving, in fact, that I want to, in some sense, oblige viewers uh, to do as they look at that first film and as we try to make it public. Nonetheless, I think it is true, as you perhaps were ending at it, your second question about international reaction to the economic war. Um, it is true that lots of people uh, were inspired by the events of Uganda in 1972. Um, and this sense of inspiration was not simply a delusion. That's a point that I make in this book that I'm trying to finish. In fact, that I have finished now. Um, it is to say that actually around the world for Black uh, you, Americans, for Black Caribbean people, and for many Africans, the economic war was a signal moment in Black le economic liberation. In the States, there was a, a Black American activist named Roy Innes, who was the head of the Congress of Racial Equality, who was inspired by Idi Amin's um, revision of the Ugandan economy and who recruited hundreds of Black American delegates to travel to this country to take up positions in administration that had been vacated by departing Asians. That is, Roy Innes had hoped to conjure up a whole class of Black American administrators who would replace the engineers, the medics, the clerks, the lawyers who had left after August 1972. So too were Black American Muslims inspired by Idi Amin. Uh, Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, as it turned out, were very, very much supportive. So too were people on the left, not just Farrakhan and all his kind of craziness, but in fact, uh, Stokely Carmichael and the Black Panthers came through as he then, uh, he had not yet changed his name to uh, Kwame Ture. He, be, he was still Stokely Carmichael. Uh, African-American activist of the left, married to Miriam Makeba, the great Black South African singer who visited Uganda twice and who got passports from Idi Amid's hands after the events of August 1972. Miriam Makeba went around Uganda performing on behalf of Amin's government, and at every place, Stokely Carmichael gave speeches extolling the economic war as a contribution to, to uh, not just Ugandan, but to Black people's economic liberation. Black Americans were also impressed with Nyerere, by the way, which Ama was an international event too, in ways that historians are only now beginning to, to chronicle. So too were other African leaders inspired by the economic war. It's not a mistake that in 1975, the Organization of African Unity met in Kampala. And for Nyerere and Kaunda and other critics of the Amin government, this was an embarrassment and both of them stayed away as did many other international observers. But lots of people came, including General Gowon from Nigeria, who was unfortunately overthrown while he was here in Kampala. But never mind, you can kind of, it was a continental event. Dozens of leaders of state came and enjoyed Idi Amin's hospitality. And Idi Amin made a point of highlighting the economic war as his contribution to the continental liberation and not just the liberation of Uganda. Delegates went, for example, to... Uh, a, a place in Lake in Entebbe called, it was a resort called Cape Town View, where they walked up a hill and watched as the Uganda Air Force laid waste to an unoccupied island just offshore as tra training, said Idi Amin, for Uganda's coming invasion of apartheid South Africa. <laughs> so Ugandan Marines staged a landing on the island um, uh, paratroopers dropped onto the island and visiting African leaders, among them Daniel Arap Moy, among them Yosef uh, Mobutu, among others, clapped with great enthusiasm and appreciation as Amin proposed to deploy the regular army of Uganda to lead a continental army of liberation against the apartheid government of South Africa. Now you can look at this and say, this is all part of the theatrical 
thing that Dr. Glebe was talking about a minute ago. But uh, for many Ugandans, as I've deduced from reading through local government archives, um, these were moments of great inspiration and they oriented people's sense of time and purpose and gave some people a feeling of political vocation as co-participants in a liberatory war that Idi Amin was leading. That feeling of revolutionary fervor decayed as the years went on, but nonetheless, for some time, it was believable. And that's a point that I think needs to be remembered. And among other things, it helps to answer the question that um, Mr. Kakandi was asking about. Kakandi, yes. Are you related to the pastor? You are. Okay. There were, in fact, lots of occasions when Idi Amin faced real political threat. He survived dozens of attempted coups. Assassination attempts were a regular fact of Idi Amin's life, of Idi Amin's time in the presidency. Um, Ugandan politics was restive. The Uganda army, in particular, was by no means under his command. This is a point that has to be made. The Uganda army was not a unanimous uh, force in support of his administration. Um, uh, and he always had to find ways of keeping the army on side, even after the events of January 1971, when he came to power, not at the head of a unanimous, um, you know, military coup, but, you know, as a kind of um, a candidate who came into the presidency almost, it seems, by an act of stage management. The backstage history by which the Uganda military came to support Amin's government is a subject for research that has to be actually pursued. Um, um, so it's that fact of political challenge that is the kind of context in which the revolutionary film that I started with here was made. Because in a time of great political uncertainty and challenge, Idi Amin need a way, needed a way to expand a base of political, politically enthusiastic folks who would back his government. To me, the most fascinating thing about the 1970s in Uganda is this. Despite the fact that President Amin faced dozens of coup attempts, despite the fact that many people, especially in Ankole, Acholi, and Longo, were increasingly uh, um, 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 engaged in uh, acts of dissent against the Amin regime, despite the fact that a neighboring power, Tanzania, was fostering a militia that was intent on overthrowing Amin's regime. And despite the fact that several um, cross-border uh, invasions took place, Amin's government lasted for eight years. The argument that I want to advance is that it was not simply military power or fear that upheld his regime. It was also that earnest people, for good reasons, found reasons to support the Amin government. Today, we can regard them as deluded, misled, propagandized, too believing of Sao Gamba's rhetoric, uh, too seduced by the images that we saw in the film. But as historians, in a time I'm an American, we're all puzzled about Donald Trump's continued hold on the American psyche. As a Democrat, as a liberal, a progressive who wants to bring a new time to American politics, I think it's important to understand why it is that demagogues, racists, and other dysfunctional politicians still enjoy mass support. Why is our American election still so freaking close? That to me is a mystery. Understanding why Idi Amin's government remained popular for eight years is to me also a challenge that historians have to understand and not simply dismiss. I think, oh, and Herman, I forgot. There are accounts of General Blair's visit to, uh, there you are, General Blair's visit to that house in Arua, he was accompanied by a man named Ian Graham, who was a major, who published his memoirs and who describes the whole occasion inside that house with great sort of precision, actually. Idi Amin was keen to get the stage lighting right. He had somebody come in and change the batteries and the handheld flashlight that was shown to make sure the shot was properly composed. Um, he wanted two cameras, not one. It was very much a theatrical occasion. Again, it was a movie set, not an organic occasion that came out of some happenstance meeting. Um, and Ian Graham describes how all, all of it went down over the course of about a half an hour of conversation there inside that house. I don't want to say more. Okay, so, so uh, 
it's after four o'clock, but I did say that we would take another round of questions. So with uh, with everyone's indulgence, uh, I think we'll start here, then uh, here, and then to to Alex there, and then we'll uh, come to a close. So mm. please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thankfully, mine is not uh, very complicated. Yeah, uh, my name is Joshua Mkama. Um, well, my concern is actually more about the access of the films. Um, as uh, Dr. Amina has rightly pointed out, I think there's a uh, collective amnesia among uh, the Ugandan masters in terms of uh, history relating to the Amin time and even before. And I think this is um, a, a gap that uh, governments that have followed Amin have used a lot. Uh, they have used uh, the time of uh, Idi Amin's presidency to reflect on their own governments, to measure their own performances and that kind of thing. So. Uh, I think information relating to what um, Amin's time was like is uh, something that is very welcome to, uh, you know, the contemporary Uganda. Uh, yeah, so I speak for most millennials when I uh, say we would like to have uh, more access to such information. And uh, I know it's uh, a difficult work. And as you say, maybe the funding is still lacking, but I would like to know how and when it will be possible for the general public to access these films. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kagai. I am a poet. And um, also talking about our collective amnesia that Dr. Dima uh, talked about. When I was in high school here in Uganda, we used to study, we had a, a subject called political education. And we used to study about Idi Amin's uh, economic war. And I remember our teachers used to give us these 20 points that we had to cram in order to, to, rep, to, to reproduce in the exam as uh, justifying why the economic war was important. Uh, political education is no longer a subject that is taught in, in Ugandan high schools. And to also talk about what uh, Professor Angelo talked about, uh, about uh, the imagery, the visual imagery of Idi Amin as a hero, vis-a-vis uh, -vis him as a buffoon. My question is, what do you think is the role that the current government is playing or it can play in ensuring what narrative we, the current generation, millennials and Gen Zs can take up to to define uh, the political picture of that day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, my name is Sevan Alex. I'm from the history department. I'm a student here. Uh, I wanted some clarity or to enlighten us. Uh, while we were presenting, there was, uh, should I call it uh, a shot of uh, Hughes is, was to be killed on Monday. Then um, Gamba doesn't tell us how it ended. I went ahead to read about uh, earlier on, I had read about this story and I'm like, uh, was it a political move? for the British government to send in uh, uh, Breyers, the former commander in the Afri King African Rifles to Idi Amin, who again had promoted him to second lieutenant to come and maybe soften his heart for the release of uh, heroes. And number two, uh, what, under what circumstances did um, should I say did Amin surrender his uh, should I call it right when they visited Arua? Remember, you said uh, Brea was humiliated on a stool. He was kind of he was kind of uh, scotting. Then later he turned his back, should I say, on a notorious Amin, and he didn't kind of get afraid of that. Then later. Like you said later, there are some pics or some videos that show prayer with uh, the president swimming together. So I'm like, how did this kind of, uh, should I say, dialogue end to the to, 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 to the point of 
uh, Amin were coming, uh, Brea then, Brea negotiating the readies of Hughes, and later on, uh, maybe that story is not covered in your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to take those and uh, yeah, and, uh, and wrap up? Yeah. So first, for Mr. Mukama, um, um, I don't know what the timetable will be for access to the cinema films for a general public. I can say that, so I was saying earlier, the digitization of the UBC's cinema collection has gone hand in hand with a larger project to digitize still photo photographs and radio uh, sound recordings. So we've digitized 50,000 still photographs out of a collection of 85,000. Most of them come from the 1970s. They're shot in medium format. We've also, by the way, digitized a great amount of 35 mm uh, still photography from the 1980s. The cameramen shifted from medium format cameras to 35 mm's after Amin's fall from power. So for the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there's a really pretty impressive still photographic archive for Uganda that is open for students to access. It's on hard drives at the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation headquarters in uh, on Nile Avenue. The inventory for the whole collection is available on my website. The UBC doesn't have the inventory as yet on its website, although I understand that they're working on this. But for the past several years, this collection of photographs has been um, uh, digitized and available and has been used, in fact, by students and researchers and filmmakers in making historical reflections on the events of the 1970s. And you can access it too. It's easy to do. It's not on the internet because the UBC wants to retain control over the collection, but users can go to Nile Avenue, sit with the archivist and look at photographs that you're interested in seeing uh, on an arrangement that's been set up to accommodate uh, students who are interested in this. When we were organizing the scanning right before COVID, we had teams of students from Makeda Day come to learn about what was in the collection. And perhaps it's time for another delegation from the history department to UBC. I don't know. Um, uh, question: The second set of questions comes from Mr. Kagai about political education. Um, to me, it's remarkable that in uh, Kampala, and in with only a few other exceptions, even in Uganda more generally, there remain such scant resources with which those who wish to mourn the events of the 1970s can learn about and remediate their trauma. Um, in Kampala, the only place where one can find a memorial to those who died in the 1970s is on the grounds of the Lubidi, where there's a cellar adjoining the palace and downhill from it, which the Buganda Kingdom has now, as of a year ago, put up a sign describing what went on in this cellar in the 1970s. It was used as a prison house where prisoners in those years in the 70s were kept and tortured. One of several sites used by Amin's PSU, SRB, and other agents of state to torture victims of Amin's regime. It's worth saying that this otherwise unremarkable uh, cellar, there's lots of other places that could be memorials. The Serena Hotel, not far away from here, was uh, at the, in those years, it was called the Nile Hotel. And there were whole floors of the hotel given over to the public safety unit where people were tortured and murdered within those rooms. When the hotel was given over to private ownership, and the Serena people took it on, they renovated the grounds and apparently found human bones buried in the courtyard. It was at the grounds of the Serena that the Archbishop of Uganda, the Most Reverend Janani Lumun, was put on trial in 1976 before an audience of soldiers and condemned to death. It happens, coming back to the point I was making earlier, we've recently digitized the sound recordings from that occasion. So. The Radio Uganda had microphones at the Nile Hotel as Mustafa Adrisi asked the assembled Swahili speaking crowd of soldiers, what should we do with him? And they say, kill him, Mue in Swahili. Um, that recording is one among several hundred sound recordings that we recently gave over to the UBC's management out of an ongoing digitization project that's linked up 
with the photographic project I was talking about a minute ago. So the Serena Hotel, there should be a memorial to those who died there. There should be a memorial in Makindie, uh, where so many died. There should be a memorial in Nakasero at the SRB headquarters. Even in Makedide, Nakasero, the building where the State Research Bureau was located and the Archbishop was killed, is now the headquarters of the Internal Security Organization. It was open for a few days in 1979 after the Amin government fell. The Tanzanians liberated Kampala, and from 11th to 14th April, the building was open. People who lost relatives in those years could go through the building. It was full of papers describing what had happened to specific people in those years, apparently regarded this open source research project so important for the therapeutic remedi remediation of the violence of those years. Apparently, they regarded this as a threat. So uh, Professor Lule's government, for all of its otherwise commendable aspects, closed down the SRB archive, put it into boxes. I'm told that the archive eventually appeared at the Uganda Museum, where it was kept for some months in a cellar. And then at some point, army men came to paper records. We've never found, and no one else knows where those records are located. But nonetheless, this government's, um, what do we call it, willful amnesia about the events of the 70s seems to me to be an ongoing problem for those who suffered and died who need the opportunity to learn about and remediate the violence of those years because for many people it remains an open wound. Then the third question from Alex, um, what happened to Dennis Hills? In brief, General Blair left unhappy and aggravated, as I said, on an airplane it took the British Foreign Secretary to come out a month or so later to visit Idi Amin and to plead for the life of Dennis Hills again. Uh, I'm sure that the Uganda Film Unit tried to make a film about that event, but we have not yet found it. <laughs> but it undoubtedly was the sort of thing that the Film Unit people would have been rubbing their hands about. Uh, but So that's the story. Dennis Hills was eventually set at liberty after the British Foreign Secretary came here in the same airplane. Thank you very much for this uh, really wonderful discussion, uh, Professor Peterson to Dr. Adima and for everyone who's, uh, who's joined us online and, uh, and in person. Um, you're welcome back to our seminars in the future. If you would, I see that people have signed the sheet mostly with phone numbers, but if you would like to be on the mailing list, uh, you can come and put your uh, email address uh, as well. So uh, again, thank you very much.